Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's up, folks? Yep, it's that time. It's the time for another exciting, hopefully. Yeah, it's going to be very exciting today. I can feel it. It's in the air. Edition of the Rich Redmond Show, where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. And this is long overdue. I'm so excited to uh, chat with this gentleman today. For the next 60, 75 minutes, we're going to have a nice free-flowing conversation about all things music, motivation, and success. And today I'm talking about a top call session bass player here in Nashville for over four decades and a founding member of the melodic hard rock group Giant. Of course, I'm talking about my friend Mike Brignardella. What's up, Mike? How are you? Welcome to the show. Hey, Rich. Good to be with you today, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, man, I love it. And if you guys are just listening to the show, you're on the treadmill, you're on the way to work, however you're consuming this information and you're not watching this on YouTube, Mike is sitting with this classic pearl snap black shirt, which is required garb for any uh, <laughs> session musician or touring musician that lives in the 615 <laughs> area code. It looks great. I told him to wear his favorite shirt. And he's Thank got you. gold and platinum records behind him um <laughs> and you know i've got like a wall or two that's you know you probably don't have enough walls in your house for all the gold and platinum records that you play well on. well thank you for saying you know yeah uh, it, it's really funny I, I, there, there's a whole bunch that i do not have uh they they gave them to us for a couple of decades and then they stopped giving them to us they did and then we're sort of lost track i've got some i've got some i'm, I'm gonna get just just to have for souvenirs do you get them over there at the, the the folks over there at the right angle in Barry Hill know me very well. That's they do all the framing for Aldine and a lot. Well, of I was actually looking for a place, so thank you for the tip. I okay, got, so uh, the, the the right angle. Anybody that's uh, want a tip about where to get their gold and platinum records, it's uh, R I T E, the right angle. And if you if you um, are a regular member of the community there in Barry Hill, it's right by the Calypso Cafe next to the Barry Hill Police oh, Station. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, so yeah. I, yeah, they know me in there, Mike, because because they were giving them to us for a while, and then I started, then they started charging. You know, if you want them, you can get them. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to look back twenty years from now and go, I should have gotten those. You know what I mean? And I'm, and I'm the same way, and I'm, I've got some making up to do because there's a whole bunch that I do not have that I want. So yeah, yeah I'll be, I'll be throwing them some business. Thank you for the tip. Well, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at this kind of list right now, and anybody can look up you know, on the wiki and you're on a lot of podcasts and YouTube uh, interviews, but just some of the people that you've played with over the years and the starting out in the Christian market, Amy Grant's Michael Smith, Stephen Curtis Chapman's Kathy Dracoli's Twilight Paris's. And then you worked into the mainstream country like Kenny Rogers, Gene Watson, Travis Tritt, Dolly Parton, Emmy Lou, and then David Lee Murphy, Clint Black. I remember that era. And then working your way into when I started getting kind of busy here, Lila McCann, Shadaisy, Toby Keith Skinner, Taylor Swift, Darius Rucker, Luke Bryan. It goes on and on and on. It's probably easier to tell people who you haven't played with, you know? <laughs> well, there, there's a whole lot. Uh, uh, I never worked with the, the, the guys that, that I, especially at this point in my career, that I really had wished that I'd got a chance to work with, with people like Johnny Cash, Waylon Jennings, those sort of, you know, those sort of icons from that yeah. era. Of course, they're gone now. Yeah. Um, and all that, and, um, and that would have been that would have been a real thrill for me. I did not grow up uh, listening to country music. I grew up in Memphis, and R and B was king down there, and that's all I listened to as a kid uh, until I got a little older and branched out and started listening to rock. But I didn't know country, and then I got up here and started digging in and finding out the incredible roots and all the the stuff that these people had done. These icons, of course, everybody knows John Cash. And all those guys, but to find out really what they were all about, uh, sure. Willie Nelson and all those guys, it was it was it was good education for me. I really liked it, and unfortunately, just never got a chance to work with some of those guys. So yeah, you know, yeah, we got to you know just live each day and each moment and be grateful. Like Warren Zevon had a great quote. He said, "Enjoy every sandwich." You know, he was terminally ill, and he was on David Letterman's show, and he was like, "Hey, you know, enjoy every sandwich." So, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, without getting dark right out of the gate, uh, just yeah. you know, we've lost some of our good friends, Michael Rhodes, and, yeah. and oh, and you know, some of all these people, um, and you lose your friends, and you just realize how precious all this is, how fleeting it is. It goes by so quick, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I, I've I've tried. I don't think I've left a whole bunch of stuff on the table <laughs> through yeah. the years. 
I just try to grab grab it all because I know that it goes by really quick. Yes, it sure does. Um, so the the Memphis roots. So you were a Stax record guy, you know? I'm yeah, assuming. Stax. Stax was. Um, I'm I'm trying to get my Stax had, had, had they were gone by the time I came along, but the legacy I mean loomed large, right? And yeah, and as a really a, like a younger kid growing up, I mean you hear that stuff. And it was just sort of in the air and the water down there and all that kind of stuff. Elvis, you know, lived there and all that. Got Elvis's autograph when I was a little kid and the whole nine yards. And was, there was just a lot of music there. There was also another a recording scene there called American Music, where uh, Dusty Springfield, B.J. Thomas and all these people cut stuff. Reggie Young uh, was in that crew and came out of there, worked down there in the 70s before he moved to Nashville and all that. So there was just all kinds of. You know, rockabilly before that in the first in the fifties. You know, when you know our parents were young or whatever, um, and and all that. So it was just just a whole lot of stuff. Even though there wasn't a whole lot of like actual music business going on when I was coming up. You know, we played clubs and stuff like that. Uh, just just the legacy, the history of being there was. I felt really fortunate to have you know to have grown up there. Absolutely, and I and and I, and. Uh, Greg Morrow and Chad Cromwell, two drumming icons, are from that same watering hole. Um, I think you're all around the same generation, maybe a couple of years apart. We are. Yeah, I give myself credit for encouraging both of those guys for many, many years to come up here. Clap, clap, clap. Uh, yeah. And try it. Yeah. And uh, when Chad first came up, he stayed with me and all that kind of stuff. And Greg, you know, all that. Um, it took me 10 years to talk Greg to, to coming up here, but Chad came up sooner. Yeah. He got he came pretty quick. Memphis is a great place to be from, uh, the legacy and all that stuff. And there was just so much musical history and culture and all that stuff. But to, to really thrive in the music business, I mean, it was, it was 200 miles up the interstate for me and for a lot of us, I think. Yeah. And, and, and just the willingness to, to take that step. And sometimes, you know, you have to take a step forward and there's no plan, um, but you just have to jump into the deep end of the pool. Um, yeah, thank God those guys came up. You know, I'm, I'm sure they're in the playing with you on a lot of sessions. Yeah, uh, they, they, they did. And, and um, you know, and I'm not I don't want to sound like I'm dog in Memphis or anything like that, um, because, you know, I love the, the experiences that I had down there and, and all that. It gave me the foundation to come up here and start my career and all that. So I'll always be grateful for that. I played with, did a, a record with a guy named Mary Raspberry down there. He got a deal on Mercury. And I did a couple of records with a guy named Pete Sykes down there, a really good songwriter. Uh, and we did a couple of records and all that. So all that was sort of part of my foundation. So I'm not dogging it anyway. I'm just saying, you know, at a certain point, you kind of, you feel like I'm ready to take another step. Sure. And national place for me to go and as and as historical it is as it is it is a um you know there's something in the water there obviously but it is technically a secondary market like a miami or a seattle or an austin or like you know dallas i had reached the ceiling and um you know i was playing on jingles i was in the best top 40 band in town i was doing all the society gigs and doing all the des best teaching gigs, but I wasn't doing what I wanted to do, which was to hear myself on the radio and travel the world on someone else's dime. Sure. So to do that, I was going to have to come to a watering hole like Nashville. So thank God we all did that. So or, did you come from a musical family? Or, were you like banging out uh, chords on the piano or when did you pick up a bass? No, 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 not at Me all. Me either. I, I was the black sheep, man. No, my, my, uh, I was, I was a military kid. I was actually born in Cuba. Oh, wow. When I came along. Um, and, and my dad was very, very much against it. He didn't, he was not, uh, he, he kept, he always told me that you can't make a living in music or you can't have a career in it and all that kind of stuff. And I think, um, and I don't think he had any bad intentions. I think he was literally trying to, you know, protect me, maybe save me from whatever. Um, but you know how it is. I mean, when, 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 when the bug bites, I mean, when you're determined, it's just like, you know, your parents telling you no just adds fuel to the fire. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's totally. just like, yeah, I, I was going to do this regardless, you know, what, whatever, come hell or high water. So, um, so it was that. So, no, I didn't. I got kind of a late start because my dad really, really, really was not in favor of this at all. He really discouraged it. So I didn't start playing bass until I was about 16. And that was the first thing that I picked up. And, it, again, it was because of all that R&B music that I heard coming up as a kid. Yeah. Uh, the, this, the Stack song book kind of opened me up to all the stuff that was going on in Motown 
And I went back and dug in to that stuff. And of course, back then, digging in means buying the records, you know, yeah. and going and getting those old 45s and stuff like that. Um, and when I heard James Jamerson and people like Chuck Rainey, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is what I want to do. I want to play like these guys. 40 years later, I'm still chasing them. <laughs> but well, what was that? Well, and then correct me if I'm wrong, but a few years back, you did like a bass duet song with Chuck Rainey. I, I did. It was one of the yeah. It was one of the highlights of my career. I had a buddy named Rod Taylor who uh, was good friends with Chuck. It introduced me. I'd met him several times socially, and he used to come to uh, uh, or he comes to Victor Wooten's base camp every year. Yeah, and, you know, right to him, he's a super sweet guy, the nicest guy you ever want to meet. Of course, I knew his discography. I've I've, I've stolen stuff, and well, I won't, I was going to say borrowed. No, stolen stuff from him for years, right? And so it was really a thrill meeting him. And, and, the, and my buddy Rod kept encouraging me to write a song for Chuck. And I said, Chuck, Rainey's not going to play my song, man. We know, you know, come on. But anyway, I, I finally did. I knocked together a little demo and sent it to Chuck, and he agreed to play on it. And my idea was that I was going to play, I was going to take like the dusty end of the stick, sort of play the rhythm, the simple bass part, and let him solo over it, right? But when we were talking about it on the phone, how we could going to, how you know, was going to go down? He said, "No, no, 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 no." He said, "He said you're going to do the soloing and I'm going to do the bass parts." So I'm like, "Oh my gosh, that's not really what I do." Um, so, so I had to sort of, um, I had to stretch a little bit. And, and so anyway, we wound up doing that. It was really just two basses, me and Chuck, and then uh, Steve Nathan on keyboards and Greg Morrow on drums, yeah. and that was it. And there's no, a video no, on the no. on the interwebs of the yeah, you, you hired you hired a film crew and it looks a great. A couple of little videos up on YouTube. I've got a, like a making of video, sort of explaining you know what yeah. what, what we're doing that. And then we've got you know just a little video. And and I hired a, a videographer and I told him I said this is going to go really quick. So you know be on your toes, get ready for this <laughs> one. And the first take it was done, and he, I said we're done. And he died. He was like please 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 give me another take. So we gave him the second take, but um, really, I, I, didn't, I didn't really have enough footage to do like, you know, a making of and a performance video. So I, the performance video was just a bunch of uh, stills. I had a photographer, actually, uh, Kristen Taylor, Rod Taylor's wife, who came in and, and shot a million photographs. And I cut those together to make a video. So we just didn't. We had two takes and that was it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People um, that don't quite understand the... I think a lot of people that are listening to this are in the scene or they're wanting to get in a scene like this, but a lot of laymen don't understand just the quality of the musicians in the 615 in Nashville. We only have one area code, uh, one area code, and it's just <laughs> chock full of, you know, and even just like in the drum department, I, I mean, you might say there's like probably 30 high level, 20 to 30 guys that are, it's like, yeah. it is deep. Yeah, probably five that are like working nonstop. You know, I mean, you just got to go over to Drum Paradise and you see all these guys that are parked next to each other, and it's like, "There's Gad's drums! Oh my God!" There's, and it everybody is getting a, getting these calls, and these guys just go the, all the instruments. And you hear something for the first time, and there's such deep musical intuition, and then execution, yeah. and the expectation is that we get this stuff done fast, faster, I think, than any other music making city on the planet. I think without a doubt. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, um, you're right. I've been here 40 years and I've seen, you know, various waves come in. For, uh, there was a wave in the early 90s. A lot of guys from L.A. came here and, uh, you know, some stuck. Most did not. Um, and I think part of that was just was just the pace, the tempo, studio yeah. pace. And a, a lot of that, I think, was left over from from the fifties and the sixties where they were cutting the country songs, you know, really fast, but typically there were three chord songs. So you could do that. But, but that paradigm, that sort it's, I mean, it's really sort of a business angle to it to, to be efficient, you know, save money. It's, a, it's that sort of thing. But that whole paradigm um, has, has always been here. Yeah. Uh, and it's just, and it's every single, as you know, it's every single person on, on, on the whole scene. The, the engineers work fast. The second engineers, the engineers work fast. All the musicians work fast. Um, the producers, every, all of us have spun up our, uh, just what we do into it's just going to go quick. And it does. And I think there's something to that. I think, um, I think you, you, you keep a certain freshness, a certain excitement in the music. It hasn't been beat to death and all that kind of thing. It takes a special kind of, I'm, 
I'm reading um, Bill Schnee's book right now. Yeah. And he's talking about how much time Steely Dan would spend on, you know, records and tracks and mixing and overdubs and all this stuff. And I think it takes a special kind of artist, maybe like Steely Dan, like those guys, to make it still sound good after you've labored over it for six months or a year. You know, Muck Lang maybe has that gift where he can do that. But I think there's really something to spontaneous, fresh, not overthinking, you know, all that musician's instincts when you've got players like this. Yes. Uh, and there's a group of players like in every city. I mean, everybody knows that. Of course, LA's had a deep pocket, uh, deep pool of players in New York, all that kind of stuff. So you get the right cats together and it can go pretty quick. Yeah. And and I like going quick. I mean, I, I think, you know, I the, the, you know, the, it's, it was based originally like almost like on a publishing model where it's like, hey, we're going to get one song every 30 minutes. And that that's a deep skill set to hear a song right. for the first time, go out there and execute something like, um, you know, crazy. And, and it's around for all time. Um, and I think yes. that shifted into a model where I felt like we were getting one song every 45 minutes. And I feel like now yes. since the since a lot of these cosmopolitan influences from New York, LA and Atlanta are still coming here in droves. Um, and the music has got more than three chords and there's he heavier production. Uh, I feel like there's one song right, every right. hour now. So in a three hour session, you're getting yeah. three songs. I, uh, with Al Dean, we do one song every 90 minutes. So every three hour sessions, we, we cut two songs. The only time I've ever been able to do one song in a three hour session was with your friend Dan Huff. I was lucky enough to get called yeah. on a Steel Magnolia session and we went around the block playing with snare drums, kick drum patterns, arrangements, two bar intro, four bar intro, eight bar solo, four bar solo. And we and we ended up coming back around to almost some of our original ideas, but he, we had the time to flex a little bit and go like, hey, we got a budget. We can do this. And that was a thrill. It was a real thrill. Yeah. And to me, it's like, and you're right. I think and it's, and it's, I think it's, I think you from musicians from other places, when they hear, we talk about, we had on that one session, we had a whole three hours. <laughs> I think they have got to be chuckling because yeah. that's still a lot of time to, to, to make a song that hopefully is going to be around for decades. Right. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that, um, some of our favorite records were not made under those kind of strengths. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Maybe, maybe that. And I think, I think uh, uh, having that time makes the difference. You know what I mean? It's just like you can still keep it free. I mean, even if you spend three hours, you're not, you're not tracking, you're not playing the song for three hours. You're playing it, and then you're stopping, and you're trying, blah 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 blah. You know, you're not beating it to death. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you haven't played it a hundred times. You know what I mean? Yeah. You've you made all these arrangements, and, I, and th that I think is is worth it. Um, the thing that I do like about Dan's records, uh, well, there's a lot to like about them, but he makes sure that everybody's swimming in the same stream, in the same direction. There's no, you know, every eight bars all fill and all that, and there's this big scram scramble, and the drummer fills and the bass. But you know what I mean? There's none of that going on. Yeah. Everything is, is 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 really intentional, and I think. Um, to, to have it, you know, be cohesive and intentional, it takes a minute because you've got five, six people in the room and to get all that corral, yeah. it takes a second, you know? Yeah. And I think, I think some of the um, younger generation producers that are coming up, I, I just don't think they can imagine herding cats in the sense that how can I get seven people on the floor to democratically come to the right place in the period of time that I have, they would rather focus one yeah. at a time so they don't have to split their brain like that. And also it's a trust factor. I think of really, you know, you hopefully if you hire the right people, like a Hollywood casting director, people are going to hit their, hit their marks and say their lines and it's all going to work. Right. Right. Well, and I think, I think one of the things that has, um, you know, I think, I think as as things go along, every, every technology makes you raise the bar and all that kind of stuff. And the fact that um, we all cut on Pro Tools now, and that we all know that later on we're all going to get sold and scoped. We're going to get looked at against the click or the grid or whatever or the, yeah. or the tuner um, and the whole nine yards. And and I think it's very rare, um, almost to the point of non-existent, that 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 people leave anything less than you know, as perfect as they can humanly get it on that top track. 
You know what I mean? Whatever's on top, they're not going to leave anything with with warts on there or that little things that you'll er, errors that you'll the producer will find later and have to correct. Yeah, all that stuff's going to be pretty straight. And and um, you know, it's people that's for a lot of reasons. You know, personal pride. People are just really really good here. Um, and it's also a business decision too, because if you if you leave stuff that they've got to correct, that they've got to spend time on, you just might not get called again. So yeah. I think people hold themselves to a really high standard. Don't leave anything on that top track that you don't. That's not really really good. Maybe down, yeah. you know, four or five layers, seven eight, you know, takes ago. Maybe you're experimenting, and that's different. But on that top track, it better be right. Yeah, because I remember. Um, well. Usually I'm lucky enough to be on a session at least once a year with the LC or once a year. And we did something a couple of months ago at, at Omni. It was fantastic. And I really enjoyed it. And I just knew that for the, that particular act we were working with, that I was probably going to be, gr I was probably going to be gridded, but just in case I wasn't going to be gridded, I wanted to be super tight with the loops and I just couldn't get the loops quite loud enough. So I just had to say, Hey, you know, I got to have more of this. Please give me more so I can just focus on that thing. But I, I, remember, yeah. I remember you saying, yeah, yeah. But that was great. I think we were, I think we we're there for four hours or maybe. And we did four or five songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that thing turned out really, really good. I know that I know that the section you're talking about. Um, and I just remember leaving knowing that it was really, really good. Yeah, I felt good. Yeah. I, felt, I always felt yeah. I never want to feel, I don't think I've left a session feeling bad. You never want that. But once we leave, we just don't know if they're going to copy, paste, add samples. You know, it's just like you leave your heart and soul on on, on that hard drive and you just hope for the best. That's that's exactly right. And and they're, they're going to do what they're going to do. You know what I mean? They're going to do whatever they think to serve the record, to serve the artist, make the label happy and all that kind of stuff. Sure. And different styles of production, I get that. Um, there's one guy here that I ha I haven't worked with in town. Uh, really like his records and all that, but I know he's he likes to uh, just you know loop the chorus, loop the verses, and have the guys play over and over and stuff like that. Wow. And I told about one of the uh, players on his session that he's he said he's data harvesting, and he's so he's he's looking for. You know, he doesn't want you to play at the same time and he'll go through and he'll pick and choose. So, you know, going in that this guy is going to work that way yeah. that you're not going to get. Uh, to me, uh, you know, the other thing that I used to do back in the day is that, like if I had more than three places that I wanted to fix in a song, I just do another track because I like I like the idea of flow. You know what I mean? And it's just it's just that. Um, but I think when you walk in, especially the way records are produced these days, I think, it's, and you know the producer is going to do that to you. You're going to loop the chorus for 10 or 15 minutes, and then you'll move on and loop the verse, whatever. I think you shift a gear, and you have to accommodate his uh, style of production because technology has changed the way records are made, as we yeah. all know. Well, that's really interesting, and I'm, I'm down with it. I mean, we're in a service-oriented business. I tell everybody we're yeah. basically one creative uh, spoke and a wheel away from fries with that. I mean, basically, we're just, you know, we're in a, we're, 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 we're a service-oriented business, but I do prefer to capture a complete performance of space and time in the moment, top to bottom, if we can. Yeah, me too. You me know. too. It, 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 again, if time allows and all that kind of stuff. And typically, it's just like, Oh, I need another three and a half minutes. Just give yeah. me one swing at it. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and people, yeah, they're really accommodating, as you know. Um, it, it's it's one of the thing, one of the many things that I like about Nashville is that you're right on each chair. There's you know an X number of people, five to twenty people, or whatever. Five to twenty so people. Yeah, you're going to see the same same thing with engineers, second engineers, uh, studio managers, and all that stuff. And it becomes pretty quickly a pretty close knit. Uh, family, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, well, not family, but or organization. Put it that way. Not family, but but and and, and the cogs in the in, in the wheel work pretty well here. To me, yes, they do. It's it's it, it is amazing thing to be part of. Of course, you know you play live. You go out and do tour. You're touring with Amy Grant right now. But you, I mean, just to be a you know a recurring theme in this four decades story really speaks to your flexibility and being able to take direction and your personality and all that kind of stuff because the flexibility 
and being affable and being able to give people what they want with a smile on your face and being able to read the room. I mean, that just speaks volumes. I mean, if I were to take, let's see, let's just look at this here. This is 365 days times, let's just say 40 years. You've been playing in Nashville on recording sessions for 14,600 days. And that's a lot of pleasing people. You know, that's a lot of yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You know, that's it's it's uh, being able to be flexible like that is not everybody has that gift. Yeah. And, and look, I mean, and, and, and I think all of us, it, it's the same thing. You know, you, you get in there, you give it your best. You try your best. I can I mean, like a lot of musicians, you kind of I can I can remember the ones that that didn't go so well. I mean, sometimes I miscast. You know what I mean? And I try to do my best. Uh, that was one of the first things right out of the shoot. I realized that you, that I've got to ask more questions about if there's somebody I've never worked with, or I don't know what the project is, just ask a few questions about what is it and all that kind of stuff. Cause I hate to be miscast and, yeah. and show up to a date and maybe they want a, a really great jazz upright bass player. Well, that's not me. You know what I mean? I just, I just took it up a couple of years ago. I'm really a first grade bass player. Right. So it's just like, I don't want to show up and, and be that guy or, um, whatever show up and be the guy who can shred at 300 beats a minute you know <laughs> you know what i mean it's just like I, I admire those bands i admire that music but it's just but you, so it's I, a lot of it is that you know it's yeah. just like i want to show up and do a good job more I, I want to please you if i can you know and i think a lot of that is casting because i'm not you know because you think about a, a, a session musician's job description is please all the people all the time and if that's not a definition for insanity, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I know. Yeah, we're trying to do something that is is insane. <laughs> it's like it's just like because as we all know, it's impossible to please all the people all the time. Sometimes, you know, you can disappoint somebody. Um, you know, and so I I know my weak point, uh, weak pot, uh, spots, weak yeah. points, and and all that. So it's like I try to, you know, save us all a bad experience. From man, what is this? It's a hardcore jazz gig. Uh, let me recommend you somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. But uh, my, um, obviously, it's worked out. We were, we were talking about Dan Huff, who has been kind of like a pivotal figure in your life, not only because you ended up playing in Giant, and but you also lived in Los Angeles for five years, which is always a great thing. I lived in Los Angeles for five years, and I think everybody should do five years out there in the yeah. palm tree. It just kind of opens up your mind. There's different styles yeah. of music. Um uh, Tell us about your relationship um, with uh, with Dan, who has also been on the podcast. Yeah, well, I met him doing sessions here. Uh, right. Actually, when I first started playing, uh, when I first came up here, I was like, like you said, I was in the Christian music uh, industry, and he was doing a lot of that. He, he was he was in a, a Christian rock band called Whiteheart way back in the day, kind of a groundbreaking Christian rock band. Yes, and um, he did a lot of sessions with Amy Grant and all these people. So I would see him on these record dates. And we hit it off. I mean, great guy, amazing guitar player and all that kind of stuff. So we became friends kind of right out of the gate. Um, I met his family and just fell in love with his mom and dad and his brother Dave, whatever. You know, just the whole uh, family were just really amazing. Um, and um, and so we did sessions through the years. And then he decided to move to Los Angeles. And I still, you know, it's every it, it, once in a while I'd go out there and work and I would see him. Or he'd come here and I'd see him. Um, Amy Grant was doing this thing where she was going up to Caribou, Colorado once a year and doing a record up there. So we'd go up to uh, Caribou and if it, spend a couple of weeks up there doing a record. I'd see him there and stuff like that. So we kind of kept up, kept up the friendship and all that stuff. And he and Alan Pasqua decided that they were going to do a rock band, a lot of rock band. And they tried actually um, the, the, the final four, uh, Dan and Alan and then uh, David and myself, that was like about the third incarnation of what eventually became Giant. They had tried. They used Chris and Bowden on drums. Oh yeah, know, is a great drummer from they Chicago. Had, yeah, had other people, Denny Belfield on bass, and they had some great players. But it just, I mean, you know, things just click or they don't. Schedules and yada yada. Anyway, um, so Dan finally turned to Alan one day and said, "Hey, listen, let's try my brother on drums." And I got this friend in Nashville. Let's try him out. Let's see if you like him on bass. So I came out there and it worked, it clicked, all that sort of stuff. So, um, man, I basically moved out. I was out there from like 88 to 93 uh, chasing that. And um, it was, for me, it was a great experience. Uh, the, the main thing I did, I, I did it. Of course, the business plan was to be millionaire rock stars. We didn't quite pull that off. But, but the other reason that I did it was to really, it was just to work side by side with Dan. 
because he because I knew that, that I would have to up my game to hang with him, which I did. Um, and he just was just such an inspiration as a musician, right? And then I met Alan Pasqua, who was all that on keyboards. And so it was like a double double of all that. And it yeah. was really, really a, thr a thrill for me. I enjoyed every single second of it. Um, I think, you know, our timing was off and whatever, whatever we didn't, we weren't the millionaire rock star. It was a little but bit I towards was, the end of the, of the hair thing, but you guys still did. Well, work. it was, it yeah. was, and we got, um, you know, every, every band's got a story, but we, we got tangled up with, uh, with a producer who tried to sign us to a production deal and it basically cost us a year of untangling that and then working out a new situation and with the label and blah, 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 all that. So that, that year, I think. We, we always talk about, we said if we maybe had, you know, started a year earlier and just established a foothold, maybe, you know, had a little bit better base, we could have probably rocked on. Because the bands that had been around for a while, uh, even though they stopped getting radio airplay, I mean, Van Halen and all those guys, White Snake, they continued to tour and make a fortune, right? So they, they still did really well. Um, but we just didn't, we did the wheel turn right as our first record came out. Um, in, in 89 <laughs> and Nirvana and Pearl Jam and all that was coming in. And it's like melodic rock was like, was yeah. out. So just, it is what it is. Oh, it's great, man. But you know, would yeah. you have looking back, would you rather have had that happen? Global success, private jets, or this other legacy that you've had in the last several decades where you well, can hear, you can hear yourself on the radio or in the supermarket or in an elevator i bet all day long well there i mean and there is that i mean there is that and, and, and i don't here's my thing i i joined that band with my eyes wide open i've been in bands before sure. i knew you know what the deal was my session career is actually was starting to you know take off and i knew what i was leaving i was well aware of all that but I wanted to have one last go at being in a band. I mean, I, I, when I started my career, the whole goal was to be in a band, be, you know, sure. be in a big Led Zeppelin, whoever. But you play and, the bass like a band guy. And I, that's probably one of the many reasons you work all the time. Well, well, thank you. I mean, but yeah, just a band. I mean, you guys, I mean, you, you play on the records, you do the tours. I mean, it's just a real band band, you know, yeah. so, but I want to do all that. And, um, I knew I was rolling the dice and I didn't care because again, I wanted for me, just the experience playing five years with Dan and Alan, it's just amazing. Yeah. I mean, talk about opening you up. I mean, it was just totally worth the trip to me. And we, um, you know, and I don't, I don't blame our record labels. I had really good experiences with A&M and Epic, both labels that we were on. They both did great jobs for us. We did videos. We we went to England to make our first record. We lived over there for three months. I mean, on and on. You know what I mean? It was just great. We toured the world. Um, I don't I don't really have any complaints about that whatsoever. And then yes. I try not to do what if, what if, what if, because you never you just try to make the best decisions you can with the knowledge you have at the time, right? And all that thing. So it's like, oh, it, we weren't millionaire rock stars, but but whatever. I don't care. When Dan and I came back. Um, to, to get into the session thing again, the country way was just started in, uh, in the early 90s. And because of Dan's reputation, he got hired about five minutes after we were back in town. He was working, right? And he, uh, he's never told me this, but I just know that he did because I, I saw what happened in my career. He told all these producers that he was working for, hey, you know, if you're a regular guy, can't make it, try this guy I've been working with and, you know, touted me. And so my career took off about 20 minutes after we got to town, right? Yeah. And just rode that way for 15 years. So I have no regrets about any of that. The artists that I work with and the records that I made, the producer, all of that. that. It was, that was exciting and great and its own way and all that stuff. Yeah. I don't, you know, you can't. You can't worry about that stuff too much. You just you do what you think's right at the time and just go on. Yeah. Yeah. We, I, I, I don't know if I can compare the two, but you know, me, Kurt and Tully were in a band with, you know, Tim Rushlow called Rushlow. And we had like two soft hits on Lyric Street Records. I and, didn't know you guys were the band for Rushlow. Yeah. Wow. And then Dan came in and played a couple of guitar solos, you know I mean? On, on, uh, on a couple of the songs. And, um, 
Yeah, Jeff Balding produced, and that was when we, yeah. we it was cool to get the experience of going out there and having to do morning radio and you know kiss the butts and say please play our single, and then you go out right. and do do photo shoots and make videos and realize you got to pay all that stuff back and experience right. that side of the industry, and then just take that you know that tried and true rhythm section that already had you know had already had tens of thousands of hours and put it right behind Jason, and and so it was like a little uh, steam wow, engine, yeah. It's amazing. I didn't know that. Tully never it's, told me that. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, That's awesome. And I look at I looked at your discography and I was like, oh, Ronna Reeves, Christina Cornell, Brad Martin, Brent Anderson, all these, you know, you've probably forgot about some of these sessions because there's just so many year after year after year. And I was like, oh my God, these are all people that I played with live, you know, like at Third and Lindsley or like little mini tours. I went to I did, I think I did sp- four or five countries with Rana playing the, uh, for like USO tours and stuff. And those were your bass parts, man. Crazy. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. She, she's great. I don't know what happened to her. Oh, Rana is a, an amazing song plugger. She, I think she has her own little publishing company and she, she's been like a high level song plugger for like 15 years or so. Wow. Well, good on her. She sure is talented. She is, and she stayed in the business. You know, she stayed in the business, yeah. which is great. Good on, good on. You know, you know. I saw um, recently. There's this thing, Studio Musician Academy, and um, I, it might be a, it might be a Miles McPherson brainchild. I don't know who's behind the whole thing, but I love. It. There's like 30 episodes of this Studio Musician Academy podcast, and it's really interesting. I saw your interview on there. Um, I almost want to ask Miles, like, this is we're catching the tail end of this because this is kind of like a disappearing job and we're trying to train people to do a disappearing job, but I think it's great. I mean, it's, it's the same thing that kind of we're trying to accomplish with this podcast. It's like, you know, you could take some of these insights and apply it to what's left of the music. business. <laughs> I don't, yes. Not to be dark, but you know, no, 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 no. I get that. And you're not, cause, because I think about that a lot because um, I remember when I was coming up, um, just knocking around for, I started reading guitar player magazines and there was a Tommy Tedesco had a column in there yeah. every month. And it just, there was something, I have no idea why I latched on to guitar player magazine. Cause that wasn't my wheelhouse. And this column with Tommy Tedesco and every month it was about his being a studio musician. And he would always say what the date was. It was always some like a big movie date or some big record date or something. And he would talk about the date, and then at the very end of it, he would talk about the instruments that he played, hours worked, wages earned. He had that at the end of every column, wages earned, down to the penny, you know, $842.36. And I remember looking at that and thinking, that's how much you can take being a studio musician in the studio. It's like, that's what I want to do then. Because I've done these records, like I said, done these records with these artists that have been playing around in Memphis. When I went in the studio, I really, really, really liked doing that just Mm -hmm. recording and just trying to figure out, you know, my butt with both hands. I mean, you know how that is. My headphones, I can never, you know, just all the things that you do when you start. But I really, really, really like the process of making records, working in the studio and all that stuff. And I thought, whoa. And and, and so what what is is a session musician? I couldn't exactly figure out what that was. And I was reading, my window was the Tommy Tedesco column from way back in the 70s. You know what I mean? Just that was my little window. He was out in LA, of course. Yeah, doing all the huge stuff with the um, uh, with the Wrecking Crew. And did you see that documentary? With, well, his- I, I, I don't think he was with the Wrecking Crew. Per se. Well, maybe he was. He, he was probably one of the guitar players. But but he did all these dates because he was really a good reader and he played a lot of instruments, bazooki and all these things. Right? Yeah. Really a, really a rounded guy. So, um, a well-rounded guy. And so I thought, man, look, that this can be a career studio musician that could be a profession and all sure. that so and so blah 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 and so we all know what happened through all the all of the decades um and so now you spin forward now from the 70s to, to 2024 and and it's not quite that way you know there's it's it's you know uh, splintered and it's a it's a different different sort of thing and one guy with a computer, a really good program, can go in and make the record by himself and all that kind of stuff. So it wasn't a lot of that going on back when. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm, I, we were talking about this the other day. If I was starting out today in music, I'd, I'm not sure that I'd go for a studio player per se. 
maybe, maybe not. Um, maybe more of an artist kind of thing, trying to be an independent artist or something like that. I yeah. mean, I was, because for me, I'm always trying to, you know, how can I, you know, I don't have a network around me. I don't have a rich background. I don't have all this and that, but sort of I, as an individual, can sort of make my way through, through this career that I want. And so I'm not sure that's what I'd pick. Maybe, maybe I would, maybe not. Maybe something yeah. else. I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, I mean, yeah, just, I think, I think I'm, I'm, let me just say, I think it's because, because of social media, because of the way you can market your own stuff now, yeah. that to me looks maybe a little more interesting if I was starting fresh. Yeah. I spent my teens and my twenties preparing to be like a Greg Bissonette character. I was like, I'd like to play on the Tanya Marie record and go kick a big band and play on the friends theme and then go out with David Lee. I was preparing yeah. myself to do that. And, um, then, you know, the music industry kept changing. And for me, I guess the model was like, do everything tour, record and teach. Yeah. And I just try to cover my butt. Like, you know, if you can't, bring me into a session or you don't want to pay my rate at here at crash studio where the drums are all mic'd up and ready to go. Well, at least you can buy my little 39 99 loop and sample package, you know, a producer yeah. can buy. So I'm always just trying to cover my butt. And I feel like all sure. of us have to wear a, mul a multiple hats nowadays and be willing to like go out there, jump in the bunk, you know, and, yeah. um, you know, these guys that might not be are great drummers, but they are bass players and, they're not getting called for music row so they can buy all the mics and the laptop and everything and do the thing at their house but still they have to have the relationships like you have so many relationships over 40 years to get the call so it all comes back to you know mixing and mingling and people and being on people's right. list and being top of mind and all that stuff and 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 you have just crushed that <laughs> and are still crushing it <laughs> well, thank you man thank you amazing uh yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, um, I don't know if you listen to that thing with Miles, but but oh yeah, the, I, I've been I've been consuming them, and I'm like, this is great. It's a great thing. I don't know whose brainchild it is, but I'll I'll, I'll ask uh, around. It is, it's um, it's um, I'm blanking on his name now. It'll come to me in just a second. But um, he does it with his with his partner. It's going to come to me in a second. But um, uh, I think um, oh, I don't know what I think because I'm, I'm th trying to think it so hard of this guy's name. Uh, oh gosh, I'm blanking. Well, we'll yeah, put it in the show. Wait, well, you text me, and then I'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, but I think, um, uh, yeah, one of the things that he was talking to me about was 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 about uh, uh, you know what do you do with your spare time, and and, and I told him it's just like well. It's just like my wife has kidded me about this for 30 years. It's just like I really spend a lot of time just fooling around in my little music room. I don't call it studio, my little Pro Tools room, right? Sure. And just fooling around bases and listening to music. I mean, it's, it's still it's 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 what I would it's what I do in my spare time. Still, <laughs> pretty one dimensional. You know what I mean? I, and well, it's just I, like, I love that. Well, just, there's that laser focus like, you have. You you live it. You breathe it. There's no other things. Do you have any, you know, you don't collect stamps, ships in a bottle, do whiskey tasting, smoke a cigar, <laughs> nothing. You have no bad habits. No, I love I'm that. not into being a furry. None, none of that. None of that. <laughs> I'm always yeah, looking I mean, for somebody to smoke what, a cigar with. Yeah. My wife said, you know, you don't have any hobbies, you know, besides playing bass. And I said, well, I'm at the time it says I'm, I'm learning Pro Tools. She said, you're not quite getting it. And I said, and then up, I'm going to learn it up, right? That's on my list. And she said, you're not quite getting it. It's like, it's all, it all comes back to that. So it all comes I'm back to music. It. Yeah. Now, what, what did, uh, with uh, the risk of being nosy, what is your, what does your bride do? You've been married a long time. That's She's great. a Pilates instructor. She's a really successful uh, Pilates instructor. Been doing it 25 years. Oh my God. She's got her own studio called 615 Pilates uh, in Bell Mead. And she's had that for about seven years. So yeah, she rocks. She works her butt off. That's incredible. Yeah. Oh, Pilates instructors, long, lean, strong core. Oh man. And I am like, I'm like, when I go over there and try to do mat classes with the women, I'm like the comedic relief because <laughs> it is hard. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've tried the Pilates. I've done the hot yoga. Um, you know, I've been a runner my entire life and I tore my meniscus over the uh, pandemic because you know too much of a good thing is a bad thing you know it's like everything in moderation including moderation but i was running like seven eight miles a day during wow. the covid and i you know 
I pulled my meniscus and I had to rehab for six months. And so now I'm no longer a runner. So I go to the gym and I'm doing like functional strength and mobility and speed yeah. walking and on, on the, uh, the Stairmaster. I miss the running. Um, but either way, you got to find the way to burn the calories. In the office, when I play, I had the scientist come out and she hooked these electrodes up to me. I burn a thousand calories during a 90 minute set with Al Dean. Wow. Good on you. So in the off season, I got to figure out a way to, to burn the thousand calories. You know what I mean? <laughs> Otherwise I'll turn into like Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So, so what are uh, any advice for somebody that wants to do anything in the creative arts at the highest level? You know, just some general advice. Oh man. Um, I mean, there's so many things. I mean, yeah, my perspective has been, uh, for, for me, uh, of course, like a lot of us, I spent a whole lot of time on YouTube during COVID, right? Yeah. And my perspective has really been broad. And I'm amazed at how many unbelievable bass players there are out there and drummers too. I, I yeah. love the, the guy, the Spanish drummer, Real, whatever his name is. Oh, is he uh, is he the guy that does the one handed rolls and like all that kind of he, stuff? He can do the one handed everything. That guy is I love that guy. Anyway, I spent a lot of time on YouTube and was amazed at how many bass virtuosos there are out there and how much stuff is going on. Um, and 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 from all over the world, um, sure. not just the states, but just men and women who are so good, so creative, so just exciting to watch and just turns me on to just all kinds of stuff. Every time I go to YouTube, I find something new that really excites me. Um, and so I think to me, it's like, if you want to jump in, be really realistic, take a, take a good survey of what's out there and realize that, that the bar is, is pretty high. Right. Mm -hmm. When I came to, um, I thought when I first came to Nashville in 1981, I really thought I was hot stuff. I thought I was going to show these country bumpkins and how it went, right? And I got to town, and there was uh, David Hungate and Glenn War and Michael Rhodes and Victor Wooten. <laughs> Forget Edgar Meyer. <laughs> Just yeah. like, I'm like, oh, my God, back to the drawing board. I got to get to the woodshed. <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? It's just like, no, man, there's so much talent. So, so that's your competition. So – if you if you want to dive into this pool, there's plenty of room. The water's warm. Come on in, but just realize that that's that's the bar. You just you really have to be willing to work. I think, and as you know, I mean, ten thousand hours is a start. You know, sure. but, but that's a good start. It, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, it, but it's that, but it, but it really is. It's kind of that. Um, yeah, and, and you know, so. Uh, and, and as far as any magic thing, I don't, I don't know. My career has been so much luck and random stuff. And um, I don't know, even if I would have been here, if I hadn't been, I was out on tour with a, a Christian rock band. Uh, Greg Morrow got, got me to get way back when. And Memphis is that the Garmo and Key? Is that the Garmo and Key? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're right. I was yeah. touring with him. I was doing a little six week tour and they got a call from Amy Grant's management said we have that. She wasn't Amy Grant yet. She was just starting out. And they said, we've got this artist who's um, who's going to do a couple of shows in Oklahoma, and she's never had a band. She doesn't have a band, and we'd like to hire Garmo and Key to be her band. Nice. And so so we did. We showed up and, and learned her stuff and did a couple of gigs, and it turned out we really got two live albums out of it. They, they used every note we played. <laughs> Amazing. Like we, we, we played two nights, and they got two records out of it. So they both went gold. It was all good. But that's how I met her and Brown Bannister. And and, and uh, because of Brown, he sort of, he was the guy who opened the door for me up here. And then that started everything, right? But it was just a random, I just happened to be subbing for somebody in Memphis out on tour with the Brown Monkey when they get the call, right? And I just happened to be on a date one day when Dan Huff shows up. And then five years later, he calls me to be, it's just, you know what I mean? It's all. It's and and so much 40 years later, you still have the relationship with Amy and now Amy and Vince and the, the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, Amy and Vince were going to go down and do a gig in Miami in uh, about 10 days, in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Amazing. Is Pat so, Buchanan playing in the band? Yes, he is. Uh -huh. All right. It's really, 
Uh, John I, I, I love that nut, man. He's he's a he's a he's a delightful nut. He really is. He's yeah. so talented. He's. he's I want to have guy. him on the show. I want to have him on the show. But and you play with him around town, right? With Greg and a thing called Groove Yard. Are you two guys doing yeah. that a little bit? Yeah. It was a it was a soul band. Uh, Greg and I were going back to our roots, <laughs> growing up in Memphis. Yeah. And um, Reese Mine joined us. So, and then John Cowan, um, and and then we said, of course, Pat. And then we had a band. And then we added a horn section to it. So we we did old r&b music al green and uh, marvin gay and stuff like that yeah amazing it was good we did that for about 10 12 years and then everybody scattered john's playing bass with the doobie brothers now oh, yeah. uh, reese of course has been out for many years with joe Bonamassa. i don't know if he's still with him but anyway he was out with him for you know forever yeah and all that so you know how it goes yeah national hard to keep together <laughs> you guys will have to put the band back together and do a, a monday tuesday at uh third and lensley well, actually, Ron talked to me about that the other day. <laughs> Ron Bryce from down there. So, yeah. That's amazing. I'm trying to find something, you know, because I've been doing the, you know, the same job, knock on wood, thank God, for a long time. Very grateful uh, to have a home base in the music business. Uh, but I just want to get out and do some playing around town, but I don't want to, you know, schlep downtown and just play cover songs with unknown musicians. I want to do something really special where you can almost make an event out of it, like play four times a year at a third in Lindsley and yeah. pack it out. So, I'm sniffing around trying to, th you know, the, the biggest challenge in something like that for me is finding a, an inc just an incredible front person that wants to That's play it. in a band. The singer. I know. I know. It's, it's like when, as soon as John Cowan joined us, it's like, it doesn't matter what else is there. We have a band. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's John Cowan singing. So, you know, after that, it kind of didn't matter. <laughs> Try it, trying to find that, that <laughs> charismatic and nice front guy that doesn't have lead singer disease. Tell me, tell me. That is they're a out, I know they're out. You know, the town's probably crawling with them. It's just, it, it just, you know, needle in the haystack kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, so, and then for the, uh, if there's any bass nerds listening, do you want to just talk really quickly about your, uh, you know, your basic setup? Are you, are you a big pedal board guy or what's your thing? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I like, a, I like having a pedal board, um, especially, for, for, you know, for a lot of the, the gigs right now, don't want to pay for cartage for bass, right? And, you know, demos and limited pressing things and smaller budgets and stuff like that. So my pedal board sort of takes the place of all that. You know, you finally find this good quality stuff that you like that works for you and all that sort of thing. So I've got one for the studio and I've got one, a smaller one for the mobile little live rig. Um, but, but I mean, to me, it's like my pedal board is just it's just an extension of what a rack might be, which is just I mean it's basic stuff. It's EQ, compression, tuner, you know those kind of things. A few effects, distortion, and things like that yeah. that you you know based by your needs. But um, it's not it's not a crazy you know it doesn't look like a guitar player's pedal board or anything yeah. like that. I don't have boots and all that kind of stuff. I don't do all that stuff. I'm pretty meat and potatoes guy, so I use a pedal board. Um, and then I'm, I, I, I grew up on Fender basses, so I play, you know, Fenders and things that sound, sound like Fender. I, I love Roger Sadowski's basses. I've got two of his, and actually I'm having him, having him build me another one. Uh, I've been talking to Tully over the last, off and on over the last couple of years about, he's got, Roger's making a, a, a I think a, 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 what do you call it? A signature? A name. Um, and uh, he's told me all about that, and it got me excited about it. So I'm having Roger tell me one too. Yeah, you go up um, to New York and visit with Roger and have a bagel and do the the whole thing. It's great. Oh, until he's done yeah. it year after year. He's like, I got to go see Roger. I got let's go get a bagel. He is absolutely the best. Yeah, the best. Um, and I've used his bases for for decades. Um, so so to me, it's like Fenders. I've got a bunch of old Fenders, and then I use his bases. And then there was a guy down in. Um, 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 just south of town. <laughs> I can't call a thing today. I'm, I'm, I've, I've had a crazy day. Um, uh, Blues Man Vintage. Uh, and I play his bass. John really makes good basses. And they're Fender type basses, you know, that sound like Fenders and all that kind of stuff. So that, that Fender sound's always kind of been in my ear. So I play those kind of basses. And then, you know, for amps, I use, I use, bunch of different things i've got tracy Elliott has given me a pile of gear through the years they've been really good to me um and then um in the studio i mean i, I will take a rack for record dates and stuff like that it's just got the typical stuff in it it's just got an api and you know two tech and just the junk you'd normally see right running yes. to the face but nothing too crazy i love it you know it's pretty straight pretty straight ahead
I'm the same way, man. Give me a four piece Ringo kit and let's go. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. In fact, this bass that I'm having uh, Roger Bill for me is a four string. Uh, nice. I'm not even going to do a five string bass. It's, uh, I, in the studio, I do a lot of we do a lot of tunings here. That's, that's one of the that's one of the um, nice things about studio. You can actually you know tune a bass for each song, whatever. If you, so if, if I want low notes, I can just drop the tuning on a couple of my basses set up to do that, which I prefer that sound. Just I don't know something about that sounds a little better yeah. to me. Um, but Roger makes a great five string and I know that people, other people do do. Um, so yeah, it's just, you know, pretty meat and potatoes for me. I love that. I love that. <laughs> and, um, it, it, looking back, this is probably incredibly difficult. People can find you on allmusic.com or discogs.com. Um, yeah. is there, are there s- some standout tracks, one or two or two or three? I mean, over the years we were just like, Man, that was kind of a Mona Lisa. Like, I can revisit that over and over. Like, I didn't play drums on a John Waits Missing You, but I, the song never gets old to me. It's yeah. just a great song, you know? So if it's on, I'm going to listen to it. Jack and Diane is on, I'm going to listen to it. Is there something that happened over the years where you're just like, all right, I'm going to sit here and listen to myself? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm trying to think. The only thing that really... Um, Man, there's so many things. I mean, I hate to pick out one or two things. Um, I, I think, I think maybe the thing that stands out to me a little bit is because I had such a big hand in writing some of the giant stuff. Okay, yeah. Uh, and I was uh, just, I, I really like that kind of music. I really like melodic rock music, and um, that band was just a really good band of musicians. And blah 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 blah. So, so a lot of that stuff sort of sort of has stuck with me. And I think my favorite uh, giant track that we ever did was a uh, song called Chain. It was in a single. It was a big, uh, actually, the album cut's nearly seven minutes long. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I like about it, it's got, I mean, there are sections there. It goes places. Uh, and I wrote the lyrics for it. I was really proud of those rock lyrics and all that stuff. The, 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 the riff that Dan had for it is just ridiculous. The, the music that he had yeah. uh, that, he, uh, that he wrote for that and, and Alan and all that stuff. It just, that's probably my standout track. Uh, I'll see you in my dreams is our, is our, we were, we were a one hit wonder with that. That, <laughs> that, was, that was your going on the four Oh five top down, rolling down the window. That was yeah, the big yeah, rock, ballad, gay rock song. Yeah. Wrote that. And, and it's, it's really, it's, it's one of those songs. Um, it's like you you don't know it until you play it, but it's in four keys. <laughs> it's like you're going, where am I now? Um, beautiful song. Down did a great job of writing and all that stuff. And so that was that was it. But I think my favorite track that would would be Chained. Amazing. From, from the <laughs> okay, so everybody check that out on the Giant yeah. record. Okay, everyone's going to be scouring the Spotify's. Um, <laughs> And then I usually just end our conversations uh, with, you know, your, it's called the Fave Five, and you could just answer quickly or not quickly. Um, we used to try to do them. The first thing that comes to your mind, favorite color? Black. <laughs> oh, me too. You can't go wrong with black. All of my I clothes. Got- black. My clothes, my car, my drums, my drumsticks, <laughs> all black. Uh, the hair used to be black. But anyways, uh, favorite food? Favorite what? Favorite food or favorite dish? Oh, um, breakfast food, all breakfast food. Uh, breakfast is my favorite meal. I love all breakfast food. <laughs> that is incredible because that is, I could eat breakfast food three times a day. Me too. Me too. And when I was a kid, when we were little kids, it was like a big deal when mom cooked breakfast for dinner. Whoa. Breakfast you know for dinner. Mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Brinner, Brinner. So what's your combination? Is it like a traditional American breakfast where like, um, t- uh, Two eggs. How do you make them? Uh, sunny side up, uh, over medium, over easy? I, well, I do them either over medium or I'll scramble them. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, but I love, it's like I love bacon. I love ham, sausage, pancakes, oh. waffles, biscuits, toast, pastries, fresh fruit in a little cup like that, orange juice, breakfast food, oatmeal. I'm I, all of it. I'm good. Uh, have you ever had an English breakfast? Oh, yes. Oh my! With so the blood you know, sausage, the the blood sausage. Yeah, the sausage, the bangers, the eggs, the yeah. the the, the uh, grilled tomato, the bean, and the toast that they make. They 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 fry that toast in butter. It's like deep fried, and it it's not a toaster toaster. No, yeah. no, no. It's a show. <laughs> it is so darn good. <laughs> yeah, for me, like a perfect little breakfast would be like 
two, everything's got to be well done. Two well done English muffins, two strips of really crispy bacon. Give me an avocado, salt it, two eggs over medium so the yolk breaks. Now you can have that collectively on the plate and kind of mix and mash, or you make the sandwich out of it. Pepper oh, the wow. hell out of it. That sounds great. Yeah, yeah, avocado too. Yeah, that's great for breakfast. And we're, then coffee? We're... Are you a, co- a coffeetarian? Say again, my, my wife. Are you a coffeetarian? Do you love coffee as much as I oh, do? Oh, God. Yeah, I'm not a snob, but I love, yeah, I love coffee. Oh, I'll drink Folgers. I mean, and there's something about the recording studio. We, I consume massive amounts of coffee in the recording studio. I don't know what it is because between songs, we're like, oh, I'll go get another cup of coffee. Me too. Yeah. Me too. I'm always, yeah, I'll drink it all day long. And I've got to watch it because at five o'clock, I can still be drinking it. It's like, mm, not so good anymore. <laughs> it does stay in your system, they say, for six hours. Um, are yeah. you an early, early to bed, early to rise guy or are you are a little bit of a night owl? Well, my natural, if I didn't, if I didn't have to be somewhere and stuff like that, my natural thing is I'd stay up probably till two or so. That's my natural clock. And then me too. I like to sleep till nine, something like that. But I don't do that anymore. My wife gets up early. So I get up early. 630 is sleeping in for me. Oh, wow. So, yeah, which I hate. I don't like getting up early, but it just the house wakes up and the dog and all that stuff. But there's something so, really special about that. They say early to bed, early to rise. That's kind of like the thing. But you know, as a as a as a person who spent half their life on a damn bus, you know, you get off stage at eleven o'clock and you change, and maybe you have a cocktail and you kibitz a little bit, and, and then it's like yeah. two o'clock. You know? Yes, that's exact. That's exactly right. And and when I go out on the road. Uh, I like uh, Amy's touring is, is, has gotten to be more. We're doing it in chunks. So we'll go out three or four weeks at a time mm-hmm. and then have a little break instead of like every weekend warrior. Right. And so you can really, it's easy to kind of flip your schedule. Now I'm on road schedule. Now I'm up till two and sleep until 10 or whatever or nine or whatever. And, and then come back home and flip it back. Right. Yeah. So we, we, we're doing more and more of that kind of longer runs and then home for a while. And then yeah. cause we several of those booked this year. Are you a top bunk or a bottom bunk guy? Uh, now I'm 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 a I'm a bottom bunk because we had uh because the we, we just had two bunks to to the side you know on the bus so it's, yeah condos so like that condo bunks yeah condo bunks so yeah I'm the I'm the bottom kind of bunk yeah nice um. <laughs> Me too. I'm a bottom. I'm, I'm lucky. I've been lucky to get the bottom year after year. Now this could be a difficult one. Favorite? Do you have a favorite song? Something that you hear on the radio that you're just going to for sure crank that up when you, well, when you hear. Uh, well, well, the only reason I'm smiling is because it it changes from from time to time, and I'm I I, I like maybe a lot of us. I have an obsessive bone <laughs> in my body, and 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 I was I was kidding somebody about this yesterday the the latest obsession that i went through for the last probably it it just finally got out of my head but for the last probably four weeks it's been i'm not in love by 10 cc oh my god i mean and that ran through my head for a month i learned the lyrics everything it's just like you know and i'll these these songs will come in and boom they'll stick for a while and then I'll flush them out and then, but there'll be another one pop up here soon. And then yeah. I go, so it varies from, from if there's an all time, I'm trying to think, I don't know, man. Well, that's hard. That's a hard one. There's so many. I know. I, it's, you know, compressing yeah. the entire history of co- popular music into one thing is very yeah. difficult. Um, here, here we are trying to compress the entire history of Hollywood. What is your favorite movie? A saw a, a film that is on where you're just like, I don't care if it starts at the, the end, the middle. I'm okay. watching it. For me, that's easy because it, for me, it's The Godfather, and I think of those first two movies as one movie, right? Amazing. I mean, like, but I think of those two movies as one movie, and that's like, that's it. What's the thing that makes it so appealing? The the relationships, the the story, the the the, the grittiness. Yeah. Um. Man, yeah, I think it's, I think the story, I think the how how that it unfolds generationally, and those performances. I mean, yeah. like, like they're, they're, you know, the, the casting, like it was it was perfect. I mean, that's a perfect movie. It is a perfect movie. Yeah, fantastic. Well, man, I love this chat. I really do. I <laughs> I really I really hope that. Uh, you know, I just love shedding light on uh, on folks that deserve all that attention. You're a bright, shining light in this industry. Like I said, four oh. decades. It's always a pleasure to see you sitting in the chair when I pull up on the drums. You know, if I pull up at nine o'clock to get some drum sounds and I see your rig sitting there, like this is gonna be a great day. 
Thank you. I feel the same, man. I really do. I really, I really appreciate the kind words. Well, I, man, I really, really appreciate it. And uh, to all the listeners out there, be be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review the show, and pick up my new book, uh, Making It in Country Music, an insider's look at the industry. Just call up my friend Jeff Bezos. Hit him up on Amazon. He'll deliver the book to your house, or you can download it to your Kindle <laughs> or your iPad. I spent a year of my life working on that, so pick that book up. Mike, I sure appreciate it, man. Hey, do, do you like people to uh, keep in touch with you, ask questions? How, what's the easiest way for them to find you on the interwebs? Well, my, my wife is killing me for this. I don't, I'm not on social media right now. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so I, you know, it, I, but the, where you can find me is I've got a little YouTube channel up, right? So, oh, people, you know, I, I peck back and forth with people on that thing. So, um, I got to get up off my butt, off my butt, and get an Insta account. And get hey, the, good, good for you that you're not on, you know, I, I told myself I'm not, I'm not giving my information to China. I am not going to be on TikTok. Right. Well, it's like, I'm so scared. of that. And I was like, you know what? All of my heroes are on TikTok. I'm going to have to do this. Well, and, and me too. It's the same thing. It's just like, and I need a point of contact. I work with a handful of people in Europe. So, you know, sometimes that's, that's a mess. It's like, y'all rag me. It took us forever to find blah, 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 all this stuff. You yeah. Know, to get you and all that kind of stuff. They'll find out through, through a friend or a friend. So I got to get up off my lazy butt and, and, <laughs> and put up a page somewhere just where people can hit me up yeah. and say, hey. yeah. Oh, okay. So, so it's youtube.com forward slash your name. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. And, okay. And, and you'll, yeah, you'll find me on there. It's, it's, it's basically right now all I've got up is those so two little Chuck Rainey videos, but it's a point of contact. Oh, that's it. Started like that for Lee Sklar. Now he's got like 700 videos, 1500 oh videos God. on there or something. I, I watched him during COVID and, you know, watch him play all those bass parts and all that stuff. I found so much stuff during COVID. Are you guys friends? Have you guys ever chatted with each other? Uh, yeah, well, I, I wouldn't say we're friends. We're acquaintances. I ran into him in, in a studio. This has been years ago. And he was kind enough to let me play the bass, that famous precision bass of his that everybody was signed. It's wow. signed. I was just dying to like, put my hands on because I heard so many stories about it, and blah, blah, blah. And he was so sweet and kind and all oh, that. So my That's one great. interface. It's like, I love the guy. <laughs> yeah, seems like yourself, just a very approachable, kind soul, very affable. Somehow I ended up in his book, Everybody Hates Me. Um, you know, I, everybody, it's like pages and pages of people giving him the finger that he's collected oh. over like 20 years. And right. I was I was hanging out with like, I don't know how this happened, but it was like me and John Robinson and Hal Blaine and Russ Kunkel. And we were doing a modern drummer thing and we all gave him the finger and it's in there. Wow, that's awesome. That, that's awesome. <laughs> So you, so you got to hang out and hang out with all those guys, huh? Russ Kunkel, and yeah, I got to meet Russ, and uh, you know, I did a drum clinic at this at a rock and roll fantasy camp, and then John Robinson did one after me, and Lee Sklar was nice enough to watch my clinic. Here I am playing, breaking down, hick down for the kids, and having the kids wow. come up and play, and he, he's just a nice, approachable guy that just loves music, and like yeah. yourself, you know, it was a, it was it was a really cool experience, man. Yeah, yeah, I, I have I had the chance to work with Jr. a couple of times. And oh, man, I bet that he, was great. Was, I bet that was one of them, like Clint Black record that he did in town. Yeah, it was uh, James Stroud was bringing him into town for a while. I think yeah. maybe one of them, maybe a Toby Keith record, but it was it was country records, you know, and, and Jr. would come in and play. Awesome. And the thing that I loved about him, first of all, as a bass player, I mean, I could find the pocket with him was just like instantaneous. And boom. I mean, he, he's a bass player's friend, man. Yeah. He, he's whatever. And the pocket was, wow. I'm like, I'm in heaven. That's incredible. And super nice guy. Uh, but he played appropriately. I mean, I know all the stuff he can do. I know Michael Jack. I know all the stuff he's done. Rufus, all that stuff. He didn't do any. He had played appropriately for the songs. Yeah. And at the end of the session, one of the sessions, I said, thank you. And he laughed. He said, for what? I said, for playing the songs. You know what I mean? Because I know he could he could yeah. throw in a bunch of stuff, you know, that wouldn't yeah. fit, that dig me, and he, and he wouldn't do that. And I just yeah. thought, that's pro. I remember that era. That is great. Yeah, and I, you know, I never asked you. Um, hailing from Memphis, Brig Nardello. Now that's Italian, right? Are you like half oh, yeah. Italian or full Italian or? No, no, that's that's Italian. Yeah, it's 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 weird. It's like um, my family name is Brig Nardello. All my aunts and uncles and grandparents and all that stuff. But I was born Briggs. Uh, my dad had it shortened when he went in the navy, oh. and so um, I always thought it was strange that all my family was Brig Nardello except, you know, our little pocket the yeah. black sheep 
Uh, and I'd always had a thing in my mind that I wanted to go back to that name. And so when I got, uh, before I got married, uh, the first time my wife passed uh, many, many years ago, but oh, uh, sorry. She said, you know, let me, if she said, don't make me change my name twice. If, you know, if she knew I was saying, she said, if you're going to do it, go ahead and do it. And then, you know, we'll both. So I did before I got married and changed it back to the family name. So we, we, we just like skipped one generation and then back to Bernadello. So are, are you like full Italian? Like, do you cook Italian, eat Italian, and well, take family yeah, reunions? or my, my dad's family were, were both Italian, and then my mom's family were like uh, Scotch-Irish. So I'm like half. I'm a, I'm a half breed. Yeah, we're, you know what? We, was This could play into the fact that we love breakfast food so much, um, it, is that I'm half Italian and half Welsh. So And half what? Welsh. Redmond is Welsh. Welsh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a good Cool but I mean, I, I I look Italian and I act Italian. It's a very strong did gene, you? you know. D and did you grow up in Dallas? Is that where you grew up? You I'm originally from Milford, Connecticut, and oh. uh, which is uh, no, actually I was born in Norwich, Connecticut. Which, if you ever played the Mohegan Sun Arena, the uh, okay. that that casino there in uh, Norwich, right across the bridge from the hospital I was born in, and then when I was 11, moved to El Paso, Texas, lived all over Texas, cut my teeth in Texas, and then I moved here. 25 years ago which i cannot believe wow. yeah wow that's great best movie you ever made that's right you just got to be willing <laughs> to take that uh who knows i could be in dallas playing red dirt country and just work in the state over and over but i just knew that i wanted to do i wanted to hear myself on the radio and i wanted to travel the world and that wasn't happening in dallas so i had to get out right right you know? i felt the same way in memphis it's yeah. same same like and and, and uh, i encouraged a lot of my friends to come up uh Greg and Chad were two notables who came up and did really well, obviously. Yeah. Uh, some of them came up and tried it and didn't, didn't work out for them and went back. But the ones who stayed, uh, I mean, just, just the opportunities, there were just not, not as much opportunity there. They, sure. A lot of them up playing the casinos down in Tunica. Yeah, yeah. With it, you know, nothing wrong with that, but it, it's, it's not like, you know, making records here in Nashville, you know yeah. what I mean? It's just, just a different thing. Totally. So, Yeah. I think I think I think all of us have to be nomads a little bit. You just got to go to where the work is, you know. In the sixties and seventies, maybe it was in LA, and maybe at one point it was in New York. But Nashville is just where it's at. It is where it's at, and everybody. It's like the last place for the music business. I feel like people are coming here in droves. I, I do too. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. They they see that happening, and now you see how. I mean, we've got everything here, from you know the Black Keys to Paramore to. Uh, I mean, I mean, everybody, Kings of Leon, you know what I mean? It's just like everybody's here. Chris everybody's Taylor, here. Yeah. Yeah. All kinds of stuff is here. It's just like, and keeps going. Um, I just watched a clip this morning of Jelly Roll testifying in front of Congress. I mean, uh, he, uh, yeah, he's, he was testifying about um, the fentanyl epidemic. Uh, and he comes from a place of knowledge, as he, as he said, you know, because he, he struggled with that coming up. Um, Interesting. And, wow. Yeah. And so but so I'm saying it's just like all different, whatever kind of music you want. You know what I mean? Jason Aldean, Amy yeah. Grant here. It, just, it is. It really is. Yeah. And forget about the music. I mean, yeah, we've got the music, but the big thing that we, I said, Hey, we we're a real city now. Why? Because we've got valet parking and sushi. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would have touched the sushi 25 years ago. <laughs> you got to get your priorities straight. <laughs> Valley parking, martini bars, and sushi. We are a real city. Uh, it's great. Mike, thanks so much for spending this time with my audience. Thank you, really I really enjoyed it. Oh, it's man. Thanks. <laughs> thanks so much. I'll let you know when this drops, man. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one, brother. Thank All you. Right. See you soon, pal. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.